to episode 36 of Impactful Conversations. We're very, very thrilled uh, to have you here with us. Thank you for listening, engaging with the platform. Thank you for being a part of the Impactful community. Uh, we really, really appreciate the engagement that you do provide and the impact that you're all making you know, within your respective communities, within your respective spheres of influence. I'm very excited today uh, to have Nsako Mugiba with me today. Uh, Nsako is the CEO and co-founder of Jonga, uh, which is a South African company that is empowering uh, personal security through the power of community. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to, to learn a little bit more about that. He's also a mechatronics engineer by trade and has been building along with his team a very exciting company uh, since 2015. Uh, so very excited to get to know you, uh, Nsako. How are you doing on this uh, grey morning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Super grey morning. Um, thankfully, I'm not feeling grey myself, but I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and just super keen to engage with you and uh, hopefully we can unearth some some insights, you know, that can change the game for someone. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. So yeah. h- how we typically start, um, Sako, is we typically start by getting to know you a little bit better, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm going to take you a little bit down memory lane, okay? So it's wow. going to be a bit reflective. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm warning you in advance, okay? So tell me tell me a little bit about yourself uh, in terms of, you know, particularly where you were born um, and where did you grow up? Cool, cool. Uh, so I was born um, in, a, in a little village called Tulamash, Tulamash in Bushpark Ridge, and that's in the province of Mpumalanga. Um, so yeah, interestingly enough, I was actually born into a home where both of my parents were public servants and that was in 1995. So being a public servant meant that you were relatively okay. You were okay relative to other people, you know? Um, so both parents being a, you know, public servant, dad was a teacher at the time, mom was a nurse. It meant that, you know, we were born into an environment that was stable. And, um, you know, we had a couple of luxuries here or there. Um, and, you know, I don't know what it is about my dad, but I found him to be quite a, uh, an open-minded type of visionary uh, person because he, he always got us the latest game console, right? At the time, it was a telegame station. And we were also one of the first people in our street to get a TV with an aerial, right? So all of these things that I now pursue as, you know, passions and, as, as careers was all seeded by my dad at a very early age mm-hmm. in a very common time and space. Um, and I distinctly remember growing up, you know, being so fascinated of by you know, the TV and, um, you know, the moving pictures, the magic moving pictures in the box and how that was able to bring us as a family together, but also other people in the community and how they would come to our house. And, um, you know, I always say that left an indelible mark in me. And that fascination has been with me ever since then. And it's just only grown. And, you know, luckily at around the age of five years old, my dad got a job in Johannesburg. Mm. And it was kind of like his transition out of, you know, the teaching profession into corporate. And, you know, that opened up a lot of doors for us in terms of, you know, giving us access to a greater level of education and, once again, it played as a catalyst to allow me to explore some of my, you know, technological and, and I can say academic curiosities. Mm. And I think that that played a big role in terms of shaping me and giving me the, the interests that I have um, and the passion and the desire that I have to actually make a difference in, you know, the world of technology. Yeah, and I think, you know, where we come from plays such a, a big role. Uh, yeah in terms of who we are, right? Exactly. Uh, I must say Mpumalanga is a, is a beautiful province. Whenever I think about Mpumalanga, I, I always just think green. It's so yeah. green. <laughs> it's so green. <laughs> like, I don't think I've ever seen a province that green. Yeah. I don't know what it is in the water there, but like, <laughs> like you guys just have, like everything that, that grows there is just green. It's amazing. Yeah. So, I, and I really, you know, appreciate, you know, how you've shared around, you know, the impact that, 
your parents had in your life and you know yeah. in terms of forming those passions and you know speaking about passions um tell me what are you actually passionate about you know i'm very curious to get to know a little bit more about that i know we'll we'll talk a bit more about jonga in a bit but you know i'm quite curious what are your passions oh man i i have a lot of passions <laughs> i'm one of those people who are like and, I, and i'm not saying this to brag anyway but i i usually catch on to things very quickly right so the things that I try that interest me, I'm usually good at it. Mm-hmm. So then it kind of makes me feel like, you know, well, what is your real passion? You kind of <laughs> like, I'll definitely say the things that I think the most or the longest about are um, leadership. Leadership yes. is something that, you know, I have, I've, I guess I've demonstrated from a very young age. A lot of people have always said that's the trait that they've identified in me and they've affirmed in me. Um, so as a result of that, I've leaned into that. And I now, you know, read a lot about leadership i listen to a lot of content um, on the topic to just try and equip myself so i'll definitely say that that's probably one of the key uh, distinctive uh, pillars of my life mm-hmm. but also as well that technology uh, pillar that was seeded you know from a very early time in my life is another thing that really you know i'm super super interested in um <laughs> growing up i used to yeah i was that kid who was like every console man i would create like a pitch deck and like <laughs> presented to my parents why this will make me a better person in life, why it would make me do better at school. And um, you know, they would always they'd always they'd always bite, you know, in those in those presentations. So technology is something that I'm really fascinated in, and it actually informs why I studied engineering mm-hmm. and so forth. So it's another really big pillar in my life. Um, and I think, you know, just people, but just kind of related to leadership. I think people really are a passion of mine. Um, even though I went through engineering, I always say, you know, I, I could never be a CTO. I, ha- I, I, you know, I had to be the person who was building the relationships. I had to be the person who was, you know, trying to form partnerships and get investment. And that's because I think the art of connecting with other people is mm-hmm. my real greatest um, superhero power. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are the things. But I think as well, you know, I'm also very uh, big on my faith. That's, that is definitely... Probably my core identity is somebody who's really, you know, driven by faith. Um, I grew up in a Christian household and, you know, my parents were both the first Christians in their family. So obviously there was a, you know, there was a huge emphasis on that growing up uh, in terms of, you know, just preserving the values, preserving, you know, the love um, for the faith and, you know, taking that with me wherever I go. Mm-hmm. And that has really just been a massive contributor to the relative success I think I've enjoyed until this point, um, whether it be in academics, anything that I do, I always give it my all based on those values. Um, so I'd say that those are the, the key things. Obviously, there's the hobbies. There's the, you know, I love to, I love to draw from time to time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love to, you know, I love games. Um, I love music. But I think that, you know, the things that really define me would be leadership, technology, faith, family, um, and people. Yeah, and I think th- those are a number of passions, but I think yeah. they're all they're all sort of interrelated, I guess. Yeah. Um, and and I think you know it really does give a, a really good insight into into who you are. Yeah. Um, I personally can identify with a number of those, um, if not all. Um, and I and I think you know when we it takes a, a level of self awareness to to realize what your passions are. Yeah. And realize why they're your passions and, and you know how that impacts you as an individual. So, so thanks very much for for sharing that uh, with us. So, you know, getting to know you a little bit more, you, you talked to me a little bit about you know why you've you've you did engineering. But I'm curious to dig a little bit deeper. Why mechatronics? You know, yeah. what was the what was the thinking behind that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, growing up, I used to love shows like MythBusters and that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> try and take things apart, you know, try and put them back together again. Um, that was my vibe. You know, I, I actually broke our TV, the very first TV that we got. <laughs> 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 I, I challenged myself to figure it out. I, I can't remember if I actually got it right or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's besides the point, right? But, you know, growing up, I used to, I think the, the, the earliest, um, you know, profession that I wanted to, you know, eventually be, um, or, or, the, or the career that I wanted to, to be a part of was, you know, I wanted to be an inventor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know what you had to study to become an inventor. I just knew that I liked making stuff. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do that. 
Um, so that kind of started off like that. And I think the more that I got exposed, the, the older I became, I started to realize that, okay, there's this thing called engineering mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's probably the closest thing to helping you become an inventor. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I wanted to now become an engineer, but I wasn't sure what branch of engineering. Um, I'd heard of mechanical engineering mm -hmm. and that was, all, that was all about cars, right? That was my understanding at the time. And I wasn't so crazy about cars. I, I, I wasn't as passionate as I am, I guess, now. Um, so I didn't really want to like, kind of you know, box myself into an engineer that would build cars or something like that, right? Yeah. And I then also heard of you know, computer science and, and all of that as well. And that was quite exciting. But somehow I felt like I wanted to have a bit of all of those things. And that would help me become an inventor. Yeah. Um, and I think it was around grade nine or 10, I realized that it has a name, right? This is actually a degree that exists that takes a bit of different kinds of engineering disciplines. And it's a new type of multidisciplinary um, yeah. um, degree. And it was called mechatronics. Um, and that's kind of what I went for, right? I, I, yeah. That became like my, 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 my goal was to get into a mechatronics program um, wherever I, I could. That was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I must say, even though I've discovered this field in grade 10, yeah. I realized that a lot of people still don't know what it is. So I was quite early in terms of just understanding what this degree was. Yeah. A lot of my, like, you know, my colleagues at varsity were like, dude, how did you even know that this degree is even there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We didn't even know that ECT offers this, right? Um, and I think it was just really you know, knowing what I wanted to do at a young age, being blessed enough to know that, um, and then finding out what the name was, I guess, in time for me to actually make that decision. And um, yeah, it turned out to be, you know, everything that I, I, I expected and, and a bit more, right? Because there was also the electrical component as well, um, which was also really, really fun. So yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of like my story into mechatronics. Yeah, so it's really fascinating because I remember, I think it was like first, couple of weeks at, at, at UCT uh -huh. I heard of this you know funny degree called mechatronics yeah also I was like you know so so what is it and then <laughs> like, no, it's that degree where you 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 build robots <laughs> I was yeah. like I don't know yeah. I don't I didn't know that such existed you know I always thought that was like you know I thought the mechanical engineers and the electrical engineers yeah. and computer scientists all got into one room and built the robot. Little did I know that there was one person, you know, who could, who could do that. So, so that was that was my introduction into the degree. Oh, like my, you know, my my yeah. thought process is like, oh, those are the guys, you know, build the robots. You know? so, so that's what I that's what I identified you guys as at the time, you know. So, yeah, yeah. No, all the mechatronics engineering students are the the Iron Man wannabes, man. Exactly. That's that's what I, I knew that you know all of you guys. That's 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 what you guys did. So <laughs> super fascinating, super super fascinating. So you, you spoke about being an inventor, right? Um, yeah. When did when did the because you can invent in different ways. You can invent by you know going into uh, an organization, say for example, like a I don't know, like a like a Tesla or a SpaceX or a, you know. Um, whatever kind of company you want to go into and you can go and invent there. But I'm quite curious to you, what, when did the entrepreneurship bug uh, start to develop and when did you become resolute that this is what you wanted to do um, in terms of, you know, follow the entrepreneurship path? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the entrepreneurial bug actually bit me at a very young age. Mm. Um, I always wanted to make extra cash as a kid, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have, yeah, exactly. I, I wanted to have, you know, the latest game. I wanted to have the nicest soccer boots, mm -hmm. all of those different things, right? So I actually um, used to start businesses and random small businesses um, in the different places that we would live in, right? So my parents liked living in complexes. Um, and it actually was such a blessing for me because I could start these businesses. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have access to like 30 to 50 different customers, depending on the, where we were living and the size of the complex at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'd often do like car washes. Um, you know, at some point I started painting and selling paintings. <laughs> so trying, to, trying, to get, trying to get the greens. Yeah. Uh, I would even, it was so crazy, I'd even go around door to door performing. <laughs> sure. Wow. Performing, right? Just to try to, try to make a little bit of money 
baked at some point. Um, so those like these seasonal businesses that I would do. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the people who lived in the complex were so kind. You know, they they saw that okay, shame these kids. You know, they, they they're working honestly for their money. Let's support what they're doing. Mm. Um, and yeah, that that was always what I did, right? But I, I do think it was largely driven by my parents because they would say, right, if you want to buy this, try and save up for half of the you know the the amount that it costs. Mm -hmm. We'll give you the the other half. So that was always motivating me that like, okay, cool, let me go do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely have them to thank in terms of instilling that mindset to hustle and make things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, I think, you know, when I came to varsity, I wasn't 100% certain that, you know, I would just study and go straight into entrepreneurship. But I didn't even think that was top of mind. Um, I actually had a bursary at the time. So mm -hmm. in my mind, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to work this off for a while. And yeah. then you know, at some point in the future, I will definitely get the opportunity to use my skills, networks, and so forth to develop my own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's, I think, in second year, um, where you know, there was a competition that was held at UCT called Upstarts. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, my friend who was in house com, the house committee with me, um, you know, him and I would often just bounce crazy ideas off each other. And um, he was like, dude, look, I love your ideas. There's this competition. Let's, mm -hmm. let's try and figure something out. Let's, let's enter this thing. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of threw ourselves into that, um, working on something in that space. Um, and then the incident that led to the idea of Jonga happened, right? And yeah, so I'll get into that if you ask about Jonga. And that happened, and then we decided, no, we're throwing out our initial idea, and we're going to focus on this problem. Yeah. And yeah, that was literally the beginning of the full-time into, going full-time into entrepreneurship journey that ultimately led to me not taking work for my bursa. Mm. Uh, seeing this head on full time yeah and i think it's quite interesting how i think you, the early years of that were quite formative for you uh, you know they, i think it sounds like that that sort of taught you some some really cool principles um you had some some good investors as well you know who are backing you <laughs> which is awesome um and you you had you know access to, to to the market you know through the complex which is also awesome as well yeah. and i think you know that those principles are probably you know quite stuck stuck with you you know for yeah. for what you've built already today so we we started off very fast um, and we dived into you know your full life story so i want to slow it down a little bit okay so, so um i want to you know just take it down a little bit so tell me about interests currently um okay. outside of your work outside of your sort of day-to-day -day work what are your current interests at the moment hmm. um i've so I, I bought a camera maybe i think three years ago and i always say that's probably been the best purchase i think i've ever made mm -hmm. um i don't know there's just something about owning a camera and yep you know carrying it around with you trying to capture moments that's really special I didn't think I was going to get so deep into it, and I, I really have. Yeah. So that's definitely one of my interests outside of work. Mm -hmm. um, although sometimes people will try and get me to come and take photos and pay me for it, but I, I usually turn that down um, just because I think it's just one of those things that it's mm -hmm. an interest, it's a hobby. Um, yeah, and I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily think I'm good enough yet to I actually monetize. Um, but that's definitely a key interest. Another um, big interest, as I've alluded to, is reading. Yeah. And that's actually a very recent interest, to be honest. Um, people always used to assume that I was a reader, but I really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll catch it in the movies. I was yeah. that type of guy, right? Yeah. Um, and um, something happened towards the end of 2019. I picked up a book called Dare to Lead by Brené Brown. And um, I finished it. And that was one of the first books I'd finished in a very long time. And there was just, yeah, there was just something about this epiphany that, oh my God, this person's life work mm -hmm. was available to me and I could read it in a month. I was like, geez, I want to I wanna read other people's life's work. Yeah. Um, and that led to a crazy journey where in 2020, I was reading two books a month. Sure. Um, yeah, so 
I just said, you know, every day I'm going to read 30 pages and I want to see how many books I'm going to finish in a year. Mm. And I was very consistent up until I think September. And then around that time, I had to stop planning for my wedding. <laughs> so yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't read as much. <laughs> but that became something that was really ingrained in me. Um, and now I absolutely love reading. Um, and I'd say maybe another interest, the third one, um, is, you know, doing things like this. Um, I really love, you know, jumping onto platforms, whether it be other people's platforms or my own um, through my YouTube channel and mm. trying to take the learnings and the insights that I've gathered on my journey yeah. and um, recycling them and trying to simplify them mm -hmm. so that they're understandable to, you know, anyone really because yeah. um, a lot of this stuff it's it's complex it's you know people always try and explain things to you in a very impressive way um but then at the end of the day no one understands you so i think my goal my mission is to try and demystify mm -hmm. you know, the whole um thing of building a business from the ground up and making it simple yeah and i think this this is some really um lack of a better word interesting interest <laughs> and i think uh, you know quite 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 diverse in its way and i think the the 20 how many books a month did you say two books a month two books a month yeah amazing yeah that's that's <laughs> that's quite that's quite a lot <laughs> yeah. from, from, from being from, from not reading any books right yeah i know there are people who read way more than that. there are people i know who read a book a week so that's four months um Mm. But I, for me, I'm just like, whoa, 2019, you you were not reading. You did not identify as being a reader. And now you do. <laughs> yeah, now I'm, now I'm always reading. Amazing. No, that's amazing. That's really, really amazing. So in terms of your, your sort of work work life, right? So what does a, a typical day um, in your life look like? You know, what time does it start? What time does it typically end? And I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering, you know, what does what does that kind of what is a normal sort of day yeah. for you look like sure 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 um hmm, let's think about that it's not super glamorous <laughs> um, look I, I don't wake up as early as i want to mm -hmm. um, i'm usually up maybe around eight o'clock sometimes mm -hmm. now, depending um and i think it's because i i, I generally sleep late I'm yeah. A, yeah i'm an evening person i think i'm most creative, most productive in the evening. So I just take advantage of that. Um, so I'll wake up, you know, do the, the usual, um, brush my teeth, go to the shower, mm -hmm. make it a point to, to pray every morning mm -hmm. um, and just remind myself about the purpose that I have and how blessed I am to have, you know, a brand new day. And I think that's really important for me to be able to lean into gratitude. Yeah that sense of purpose, because without it, you just kind of mindlessly float around the day. Um, so I'll start my day off like that, and then I will get breakfast. And uh, from there onwards, I'll sit down at my, my, my desk, this desk right here, and I'll start working. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'll maybe want to work in a coffee shop. I feel like, okay, there's a task that requires me to be more creative, mm -hmm. you know, in a space that's a little bit more vibrant. Um, and um, I'll usually work really well in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, let me think about that. I'm trying a new system out at the moment where I only have meetings between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Again? Okay. And then between 11 and 3, there's no meetings. So mm -hmm. that's, that is execution time. Yeah. And then between 3 and 5, I'll have meetings again. Um, and that's a new system that I'm, I'm in the process of piloting because I realized that when you're in meetings, it's, you feel like, okay, it is work, but it's not real work. It's not like you're work. Work. Okay. Yeah, you're not pushing the needle forward on anything. Mm. And I found that my calendar was full of meetings um, and it wasn't helping me to execute because then I have to now execute in the night, but mm. I'm spending the time with my wife. So it was, um, you know, there's a, this, this, this kind of conflict. So yeah, this system is, is assisting me to kind of like ring fence it. Like you don't have to do all the meetings today, push them to tomorrow. Right. If they don't fit into those slots, push them to tomorrow. If they don't fit there, push them into Wednesday. Yeah. And then you're maintaining that time to execute so that at the end of the day, you know, I can actually spend time with my wife. Um, so yeah, then I'll usually spend time with my wife. We'll, you know, we'll catch up. Um, we'll probably cook together, 
um, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll just chill on the couch and watch Netflix. And mm. that's pretty much how how the day is. Yeah, it sounds that sounds great. I'm quite interested in your in your uh, sort of the, the no meetings eleven and three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to see how that sort of works out. Uh, you know, it could be could be a good methodology. You know, for anybody who is you know in the process of starting a business or has already started a business you know to adopt that that sort of methodology um i guess slightly more serious question before we head to the deep stuff uh, who who are your role models mm, 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 mm. Ha, ah, all right i think my dad is definitely my my first role model mm-hmm. um yeah just the way he lives his life, very peculiar. Um, he, you know, he, he was unlike a lot of the dads in his generation. He was, you know, extremely family oriented. Um, he invested a lot in us, his children. Um, he makes it a point of demonstrating to us that he still loves our mom, which I find it very fascinating because a lot of guys are like too like masculine or whatever um, to, to, to do that, right? And for him, he was always like, look, guys, you know, we're emotional beings. And he, he never ran away from that. He always embraced that. Mm-hmm. And I think it really was quite empowering for us as children, right? Because we, yeah, we were guys, but we didn't mean that we, we were like unbreakable or whatever, or that we had to be, you know, these mean people or whatever. So I think it really allowed us to just be ourselves at all times. Mm-hmm. Another thing as well, another gift that he gave us was that he allowed us to challenge him, obviously within the, the boundaries of respect and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he definitely encouraged us to, 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 to engage with him in terms of the things that he was saying. And, um, you know, he, he welcomed, um, uh, uh, you know, being challenged by us, right? Because it often led to interesting conversations. I remember distinctly on the way to school when he'd go drop us off. He would, he would purposely say something controversial because he knew it was going to spark a conversation. Yeah. He would, debate, he would debate all the way to school. And I think that that was probably one of the best gifts that he's ever given us because it just gave us this um, ability to communicate, um, you know, um, with, with people much older than ourselves in a way that is firm, but at the same time respectful and we could still stand up for our own views and, and so forth. And I found that to be largely advantageous adversity where you know you're in a space where you have to seek knowledge it's not just about being timid but you have to actively engage um challenge from time to time and you know that that's the learning the learning process and i realized that a lot of my friends didn't have the courage to like ask questions in lectures or things like that they would always tell themselves you know i'll just go research it afterwards or go figure it out and I'm like, why, why am I here? I'm paying to be to ask the question. Exactly. Yeah. Surely, yeah. <laughs> it was in front of me, right? Um, and I didn't realize that was a, an uncommon thing. Um, so I think because of all those reasons, um, I'll definitely have to say it's my dad. Um, but I think also as well, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's certain people that I follow as well. Yeah. That I look up to. Um, who, I, I wouldn't say it's as... It's not super obsessive. I just like to follow some of the top CEOs around the world, particularly in tech. Yeah. So I'll follow, you know, your 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 Satya Nadellas. I'll follow your your Mark Zuckerbergs. Mm. I'm particularly intrigued by Brian Chesky, founder mm. of Airbnb, and I love his story and how you know they built that business. And also um, Kevin Systrom, the founder of Instagram, as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, reading these guys' books has really exposed me to the way that they think. Absolutely. And they've been these, you know, um, role models that, you know, I, I don't know if I'll ever meet, hopefully, but um, yeah. definitely try and sim- uh, like um, assimilate some of the things that have worked for them. Mm. And I think that's quite touching, right? Um, you know, in terms of what you mentioned, how your your dad has made such an impact on you um, in terms of also how you've, you know, gleaned knowledge you know from your time in university as well um and in terms of how you interact with people and how you build your networks as well and i think it's that's quite that's quite insightful and quite impactful so thank you for for sharing that yeah. um so let's talk let's talk really about 
Jonga, right? Um, so let's get let's get to the meat of it, right? So you talked about you alluded to uh, an mm-hmm. incident where the Jonga began, right? Yeah. So let's talk about it. What what actually gave birth to this idea of this business, and where did it start? Yeah, so it was I think it was 2015. You are right there, um, June holidays, and we were part of the Upstarts, UCT Upstarts competition. Yeah. And at the time, myself and my co-founder were working on an, an, another, another idea, um, mm-hmm. actually called, I think it was called Country, Country Lights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Country Lights. And it was like a solar play, right? Um, trying to democratize access to solar. Um, and a very interesting thing, right? The whole concept around that. And we were like, yeah, you know, we're going to be the guys that bring solar and whatnot. Yeah. And, then during the holidays, I went to to visit my aunt. She stays in Whitbank, mm. and um, I'm now called uh, Emma Lachlan. Yeah. And I went there with my cousin, so we we're going to see his mom, and she lives alone. Um, then in one of the townships, mm. and we arrived there, you know, settled down, went to bed that night, and literally on the very first evening that I arrived, these guys come into our house. Sure. Yeah, absolutely horrible. Wake up, we wake up in the morning, we realize that everything is gone. Literally, like, yeah. And I, I realized that all of my valuables were left in the sitting room, mm. right? Which is horrible. Mm. So, woke up, laptop missing. Had to look for my phone, right? Just gone. to I can call my parents something. Phone gone. My goodness. Her laptop, her, laptop, her phone. His stuff, my cousin's stuff, everything of value gone, right? And um, yeah, that was obviously a horrible, horrible experience for me. Um, interestingly enough, I we, we opened the back door and we saw some of the stuff that was in my bag was kind of like taken out. Thankfully, my ID, things yeah. like that, um, I was able to, to get that. And um, yeah, there was like footprints that kind of, you know, because obviously it's like a, like a dust or like a gravel that road, there were footprints. And yeah, so there was just, there was just so much confusion. And we went to call the police and mm-hmm. the guys, hey, you need to help us. We need to try and locate these things. You know, Bella, in the, in the townships, there's usually like a bit of a syndicate. People in the community, yeah. people, they know the people. Who, they know who did it, yeah. <laughs> you know, like if, you know, yeah, if, know. Who's, if you're somebody who's, um, I guess, respected, you can sometimes locate your stuff. So we tried mm-hmm. asking different people and trying to locate it and we couldn't find it, right? And it was, it was just such a disturbing moment for me because, you know, my aunt was telling me this is how it is. Like, this is how it's been. Sure. Um, for the past few weeks, guys have been trying, coming into the community and so forth. Mm-hmm. It's how it is, right? And the police obviously were not able to do anything about it. So I had to just accept that, you know what, this stuff is gone. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, I was hurt, but not so much because of the fact that my stuff was stolen, but because that was the situation that my aunt lives in. And she stays there by herself, so she's extremely vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's just millions of millions of people like my aunt. My aunt is just one of them, but there's so many others. Yeah. So that was kind of like weighing heavily on me since that time. Mm-hmm. And I told my partner and I said, you know, Dando, we're working on this thing and it's a great mission and it might you know, a couple of years from now, we might get this right, but there's a problem that's pressing and yeah. happening now. And I think that this is one of the, what we should focus on. So it, that became our obsession was this problem. You know, how do we solve for it? Mm. Uh, clearly within low income communities, because we realized that's where, you know, the problem one is the worst. People don't think that, they think that it's, in, it's worse in the suburbs, Yeah. right? And that people in townships are the ones who are making it worse in the suburbs. But Really, there are people who just in the, who live in the townships and they are victims of this crime more than anyone else. Mm. Because the security industry, um, you know, it's not really profitable for them to be there just based on how their model works. Mm. So it's, a, it's, it's a very underserved market. And the police as well is, doesn't have enough. So there's a whole bunch of things going on that really make that such a very insecure space. Yeah. We sort of to, to look for solutions. How could we enable people to be safe in their homes, um, you know, and to be safe even in the streets. Mm. Um, and, you know, that led to a journey of us saying, we're going to dedicate 
the next however many years towards trying our best to solve this problem. Mm. And, um, you know, we're very naive. <laughs> Just two second year, yeah. student, one in finance, one in engineering, saying, look, we're going to do whatever we, whatever it takes to try and solve the problem of crime in low-income communities. Yeah, such a touching story. And thank you for, for sharing that. And I think, you know, it really speaks to, you're right, the need is so great, right? And I think, and I think the need is so great for us to, to build safer communities. And that's, you know, directly linked to us, you know, building a more secure South African, you know, future. Um, for sure. And I'm curious, you know, how, how does how does Jonga link to what you believe your life's purpose is? So so how do the two sort of how the two sort of interlinked in your mind? Yeah. Um, so I, I believe that my, my purpose is, you know, to find solutions to you know these big challenges that we experience um, on the African continent and, in, and just in the world at large. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really about using the, the skills that I've gained, using my ability to galvanize people, the leadership uh, uh, skill that I have. Yeah. And the networks to try and, you know, put together solutions to the problems. I, I find it extremely difficult to work on something that doesn't have a problem. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of just like to cool like build cool stuff and that's amazing right cool stuff sometimes leads to big technological breakthroughs that ultimately help people like me who want to solve problems so i think that that's kind of my 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 life's purpose is to help people solve people's problems mm. and i think jonga really is a manifestation of that and it's not uh, you know the, the exclusive manifestation. There are other things that I'm doing yeah. to try and accomplish that task. Um, I realize at some point that I'm not going to be the one that solves all of our problems. So I want to play a role in equipping those people who can go on and solve their own problems as well. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's the link that I see in my mind. And you know, I'm going to continue to do other things. I, I definitely consider myself uh, a serial entrepreneur yes the last venture that i'm going to do and it doesn't mean i'm gonna fall out of love with the problem and, and whatnot but it's about you know trying to solve as many problems as i can in my life yeah and i think really that's a really inspirational um take and, and thank you for for sharing that um if i had to ask you you know what 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 does stronger enable you know, very yeah. in a sort of simple sense. What does it enable, and for whom does it enable it? Sure, sure, sure. I think you you framed it so well in the beginning um, around personal enabling personal security through the power mm. of community. Um, I feel like that was our mantra at some point, um, <laughs> but it's changed so much. Yeah, like, hearing you say it, I was like, wow, that's so powerful. Why did you change that? <laughs> So I mean, that's that's what it enables. I, I think really it's about bringing security. Um, and I'm not, I'm not just saying like build it, bringing alarms, but I'm talking about the, like the opposite of insecurity. Exactly. Bringing security. That mm -hmm. sense of peace of mind, right? An alarm ultimately, you know, it doesn't make your community safer. Mm. Um, it just kind of makes you feel a little bit better when you go to bed at night. Quite right. What I think the Jungle Solution does that is different to other alarms or other products is that it actually tries to make your community safer. Yeah. Not just about protecting you. Yes, it'll protect you in your home, but because the alarm connects you to your neighbors when you need them, the people who are most concerned by your well being, mm. it's starting to leverage a more powerful force, which is the power of community. And I think what the alarm does is that it starts to remind communities about the way in which they used to organize themselves in the past. Yeah. It wasn't this thing of, you know, I put my high fences, and it's just okay. me and the world. Right? It's me and my cameras versus the world. No, this yeah. is, I rely on you to help me when I need you. And in return, when you need my help, I'll help you. And it was very interesting 
in the early days of trying to develop the product, we used to be on the ground a lot, um, you know, doing like market research surveys. And we would ask people, mm. what would you do if your neighbor was in trouble? Would you help? And I think about like 97% of people said, I'll do something if I knew about it. Yeah. And then we asked, you know, do you think your neighbor would help you if you were in trouble? And yeah, without a doubt, people said yes. Mm. That was quite powerful. And it was the underlying hypothesis on which we could develop our product that relied on community interactions. Um, so I think really that's, that's, that's kind of what it enables. Yeah, really powerful, right? <laughs> and super profound. Um, I love, I love the, the community aspect, right? The interdependency, um, you know, when I think of, you know, the way in my grandmother's village, it's like that, right? Um, you know, if, if if we run out of sugar, we don't think of going to the shops. We think of going next door. <laughs> we don't think of, it's not about, you know, I should, you know, it's not like it is, you know, in the in the sort of suburbs where it's like, oh, yeah. I've run out of milk. Let me, let me drive to pick and pay quickly. It's yeah. Like, instead of, instead of just going next door and, you know, ringing the doorbell and be like, have you guys got any milk? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's the sort of bringing back the interdependency on each other yeah. um, and bringing back the the support structure um and i think you know that's that's an incredibly powerful thing to bring back um into our communities and i think that's something which really can be a launch pad and a foundation for so many other things you know if we work together and, and if we're interdependent on each other um you know i really really do fundamentally believe that that is you know a key to which unlocks so many other opportunities so many other you know foundations so many other you know partnerships, collaborations, and so on, which can transform, you know, community by community and eventually, you know, transform South Africa as a whole. Um, so I think it really is, it really is quite inspirational in terms of what you and your your team are doing in that, in that regard. Um, but you've been doing this for six years, right? So, so, or yeah, probably just over six and a half years now. Um, I want to talk about, a bit about that journey, right? So talk to me about one or two defining moments um in that journey and how important is it for businesses to have these defining moments right um within their sort of inception or and i say inception i mean you know anywhere between sort of you know the first two to three years really um you know that sort of inception phase as you're defining yourself as a business and as you're defining your sort of work routines defining what what your what your purpose is and what you actually need to do um so talk to me about one or two of your biggest defining moments um, in the jungle journey. And you know, conversely as well, you know, how or rather, you know, addition to that, how important it is for businesses to get those moments yeah. and to, to use those moments to, to spur them themselves further. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it's okay, I would like to answer it in reverse. I think mm. speaking of the importance of those defining moments, those moments are everything. Right. Mm. Um, and the interesting thing is that they don't always announce themselves. So yeah. you have to develop a culture that identifies them and celebrates them. Or otherwise, you might not get the momentum you need to go further. Mm -hmm. just like, you know, entrepreneurs are so interesting. The, the downs affect us so much, but the, 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 the wins feel like, okay, I can't really celebrate that. There's more work to be done. So we never allow ourselves to really enjoy those defining moments. Mm -hmm. we're, we're always conscious of the fact that we, we're so much, we're so far away from where we ultimately want to go mm -hmm. uh, but it works against us because you know we, we need to acknowledge those moments to actually give us and our team the energy and motivation to continue moving forward um i think for me one of the defining moments in our journey was the realization that we were seeking the wrong type of validation um Can in the initial stages you know we needed funding and a way that we could solve that problem was through startup competitions. And, you know, startup competitions are great because quite often the prize money is a grant. So you, you're getting access to capital and you're not having to give away equity in exchange. And that became something that we got really good at. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, like, I could tell my story very clearly. Mm. Uh, we, we knew the format. We could give a, a, a good pitch. And because of that, we were very successful in startup competitions. Yeah. The thing with startup competitions is that you're, you're pitching to a panel of judges 
who are assessing the merits of your business based on your ability to tell a story, mm-hmm. which is not really the business itself. Telling a story is a part of the business, but it doesn't necessarily mean your business is, you know, you're making progress, you're gaining customers, and so forth. So it's it's a form of validation, but not the strongest type of validation. The strongest validation doesn't come from a panel of judges; it comes from your users using your product, giving you feedback, telling you they love it. So we got stuck in this phase where we were just doing startup competitions, and it felt like, yeah, we're, we're doing great, and and all we we're doing is we were winning competitions, and. One of our angel investors at the time, our first angel investor, mm. us out and he's like, guys, one thing you guys need to understand is that you're really good at this, but it's not your business. You're not going to build a business off of grants. You build a business off of paying customers. And he told us, like, I think we need to outgrow the competition phase and start focusing on building a business. And um, it was, obviously, it's a painful conversation to have because you're like, oh, man, I thought we were, I thought we were hot, man. Now you're telling sure. you're- yeah, <laughs> I, thought, I thought we were doing great. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I realized that oh my god, he's so right. Like, we're winning these competitions, but we're not we're not getting customers. Mm. So he started to make us focus more. He's like, focus, forget that, right? Focus on one thing at a time. Let's get this product built, certified in the hands of users, so that we can test it as soon as possible. Yeah. And literally from that day onwards, I don't know what it was, like something clicked and our focus became really, really sharp. And we would focus on like one thing at a time, like not like many things. If things would come, opportunities would, were always coming. Hey, it's like, oh, please come here, do this and whatnot. And I had to say no. And in that time, we made so much progress that we eventually developed the product got it working over a period of three years, mind you. So it was a very difficult journey of trying to get it right. Yeah. Um, got it certified. You know, we were able to now get people actually using the product. And it was all thanks to that defining moment of the conversation that we had with him. Um, I think that that's probably the biggest defining moment I can think of. I think now we're also kind of going through another kind of defining moment mm-hmm. um, where, you know, we realize that there are certain assumptions that, you know, were are being disproved. Um, a lot of them were, were, be, were proved to be correct, but some of them are, are being proved, disproved. And we're trying to just, you know, deal with that and understand what does that mean? And, um, you know, what does the future of the business look like? But it's something that we're still working through. So there's no, like, I, I, I can't package it very, like, elegantly. And, of course, and so, yeah. Because it's still something that I'm, you know, there's a lot of questions sitting with me. Um, but yeah, I think that that's probably the biggest defining moment and super, super important that you can acknowledge defining moments for what they are. Understand yeah. what it is that you need to take out of them. Take that and use it as momentum and fuel for the journey ahead. Yeah, super profound, right? I think you, you're quite right. And I love that you said at the beginning that what well, you said, I think you said that, that, that you don't quite really know when they're there. Uh, you know, they, they sometimes have packaged as, as something very small. Uh, seemingly not significant at the time, um, but you have to, and I think you said you have to learn how to recognize them and act on them. Um, yeah. I think, you know, for any um, entrepreneur, aspiring entrepreneur, seasoned entrepreneur who's listening to this, I think that's really profound advice. Um, and you know, around around your defining moments, and I love the fact that you're in the middle of one now, right? Because yeah. again, you know, this platform is not about you know you know, be acting as if we're all finished products, right? Yeah. We're all on a journey. And I love that you're in that in that stage where you're in the defining moment as well. And I think that, that gives a lot of um, super insightful, you know, knowledge to people who are listening to this, you know, who, who might think that, you know, once I've made it after a year, that's it. You know what I mean? This is our business model now. And, you know, there isn't any change or whatever. Actually, it's an iterative process and you have to constantly, you know, test test your assumptions, as you say, um, yeah. you know, as whether or not they hold true. So curious because a lot of new businesses center around um, an app, for example. Yeah. Um, you guys are quite unique in the sense that you have both a device and an app, right? So, yeah. so you have both the, the sort of hardware and the software. Yeah. Um, and this is sort of, a, I guess, an entrepreneur geek kind of question, right? <laughs> because I'm quite curious to, 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 to know 
you know, was it challenging to develop both the software and the hardware side at the same time? You know, getting getting that rolled out same time together. Was that how was that? You know, as 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 an experience. Yeah. Well, you know, they say hardware is hard, and they're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I love that. Yeah. It's really hard. Um, no, I, I think it's one of the one of the biggest challenges I've got through, because I mean, it's about yeah. it's about bringing the two together. Mm. And different teams working on both elements. And you're trying to coordinate those specifications, those requirements, so that the two can speak with each other um, in a harmonious way. Yeah. And because of the nature of the industry and the problem we're trying to tackle, it's very important that it works. Right? Because it's security. You don't want your security system to not work on you at the moment when you need it to. Quite right. Uh, so it's been it's been a difficult journey. I think just to kind of open up about it. As I said, it was about three years in the making of trying to just get the product. Mm. Um, in the process, we failed twice, literally completely wrong direction. We have to figure out what do we do now? Um, which network do we need to shift to so yeah. that you know this device can communicate in the way that we want it to? Um, and then there's the whole notion of design for manufacturing. Yeah. Designing something that works doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be able to pass different certification tests. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be manufacturable. So there's all these different concepts, and then you're learning them in real time, and you're trying to manage teams, and you, you know, all these different things going on. Mm. Um, it was quite an expensive endeavor, one, but yeah. two, um, just extremely complex. Yeah. I think it's, the, the, I'm not sure which was harder, the actual technical part, or the part of aligning stakeholders. But both of them were extremely hard. But we ultimately got it right at the end of three years. And um, you know, we we like to think we designed a really solid product. Yeah. Passed the tests with flying colors. We're very proud of that. Mm. And, um, yeah, I think it, it's 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 I envied software companies at that time. <laughs> Just purely software, I was like, oh wow. Oh, That's wow. nice. <laughs> oh wow, you're telling me you can just ship your product like that? Yeah, just like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think I think that's why, you know, software products have got a lot more like there's a lot more expectation for them to ship their product, ship their products sooner. You know? Because I mean you, you don't really have to even raise before you start working on a software product. You can just start coding, yeah. ship the earliest product of your product, uh, earliest version of your product. Whereas on the hardware side, there's a there's a lot of capital you know investment that needs to go into that yeah and actually have something in your hands and so forth um yeah so that's been the journey yeah and, and really interesting right because i think um we often sort of underestimate that challenge um yeah. actually rolling out you know the nuts and bolts of it um and as you say hardware is hard um and you know congratulations to yourself and your team for having rolled that out you know successfully yeah. Uh, in conjunction with the software side, you know, having done that is, I think, an, a really, really incredible feat as well. And I'm quite curious, you know, along that journey of rolling, rolling this out, and along that challenging journey, were there ever points of doubt? Um, and if there were, you know, doubt around is this actually going to work? You know, I'm talking the existential doubt. You know, not the doubt of like, well, you know, maybe you should make this tweak or that. I'm talking the sort of existential doubt. Um, you know, how did you work through it with your team if there were in, ever any moments of that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in, in, as an entrepreneur, your life is in tension because yeah. you're constantly trying to be optimistic, but you're also constantly cognizant of the doubts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just, and, I mean, you know, you, you, you try your best to protect your team from it, but at some point, I think you mature and realize, you know, I, I have to distribute these concerns. I have to distribute, you know, it's not just about, I'm the optimistic guy. I know where we're going all the time and so forth. There's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves as entrepreneurs. So I started to just kind of like, hey guys, these are the questions I have. These are the things I'm uncertain about. Mm. And the team helps you and then they also put their minds together and they come up with solutions. But to answer that question, a lot of times, a lot of times there was a lot of doubt. Um, you know, the interesting thing was that when we had finally certified our product, it was ready to go on the market. COVID hit, right? So we had the lockdown. Sure. And um, our go-to-market strategy was, you know, to have agents on the ground going door to door, speaking to households. Um, and they were literally on the ground for a couple of weeks before there was lockdown. 
Okay. So now we had to, you know, shift our entire go-to-market, come up with a complete new strategy. Mm. Uh, the process we developed an e-commerce site. We knew that the e-commerce site wasn't really going to work because, you know, people were not buying stuff that way in the townships. Yeah. Uh, but we, you know what? Maybe we could still sell some to other markets where they found product to be useful. Mm. Um, and we did get a couple of sales that way, but it wasn't really moving fast enough as well. Um, I think because we were not really pouring enough, you know, into the marketing of the product. Yeah. Um, and then we stumbled upon a new type of distribution channel or go-to-market strategy where we would partner with businesses, mm-hmm. larger businesses than ourselves, who were interested in accessing the township market, right, in some or other way. Um, yeah. And um, we could then bundle ourselves with whatever they were trying to offer, mm-hmm. creating a more kind of like a like a basket of goods that was more valuable. Um, and in that way, we could leverage off of their resources, their thrust, trying to get into that market. And that would, um, you know, pave the way for us. And um, luckily, we, you know, one of our, our very first customers, Coca-Cola, mm-hmm. was, was an absolutely incredible. So they, they started this initiative where they wanted to, pro, you know, empower township-based entrepreneurs with mm-hmm. Coca-Cola branded containers to run their businesses out of and so forth. And because these were entrepreneurs that were starting these businesses, you know, in, in townships across the country, um, typically there, was no, there wasn't like a lot of access to electricity and all those things. All of the things that really our product was purpose-built to kind of work in those environments. Yeah. So we soon realized that our product was actually one of the only things that could solve the issue for these entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So became a partner to call on the initiative and wherever they went and rolled out these containers, sure. them, which was really fantastic. Um, and then we also started to have conversations with insurers because we realized that, you know, insurance is, is still quite a new concept in the township. People are familiar with your like uh, mineral policies and so forth, but yeah. the short term home contents insurance is a very new thing. It's extremely in, like intangible. You know, you're paying, you don't know what you're getting, you know, you might be robbed, you might not. So we realized that if we actually bring our device and sell it alongside the insurance, mm. it becomes a more tangible offering to somebody, right? Like, oh, I'm getting in security. And if anything were to happen, my things would be replaced. Yes. So you see, we started to look for so that synergy. Yeah. We started to look for those kind of synergies and ways so that we could, you know, leverage off of bigger companies um, spend and, and, and marketing and so forth to try and introduce the product into the, into the market. And yeah, I think that that's, I probably have answered other questions as well. I don't know, but <laughs> I just wanted to say that. No, no, no. Thank you for that. I think that's, that's really insightful knowledge uh, that you shared. And I think a, a, a really good peek, I think, into your journey of, of doing that. And I think also responding to to the the non-controllables, right? You yeah. can't control a global pandemic. It just happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, and there's no book about that because the last time it happened was 100 years ago. <laughs> so, so there's nothing there's nothing which says to you this is how you respond. So I think exactly. you know going through that, you know, has, has probably been quite a a, a steep learning curve, but a, a wonderful learning curve that you know you can you can write about one day and and and, and you know share as you've done on this platform. Yeah. Um, the second last question to you is, you know, in terms of important principles, yeah. um, what have they been? If you could list three, you know, what what three principles would you say have been important in building and growing uh, your business, as it were, uh, with your team? Hmm. Three principles. I'd say um, one of them would be seek the right validation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's to my point earlier on around, you know, there are levels to different uh, forms of validation. Yeah. Panel of judges is probably the weakest form of validation. Um, investors putting their money into your business is a stronger form of validation. Mm-hmm. Even yet a stronger one is your customers saying they like what you're doing and paying you for it. So I would say seek the right validation. Um, another principle I think is that's important in the building process is do things with honesty and integrity. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite a small ecosystem. I know it seems like there's a lot of people doing many things, but if, you, if you're exposed to that space, you realize that it's actually very few people who are doing something that is actually making sense and you're committed to it and so forth. And yeah. it's more an ecosystem. So you don't want to create a bad name for yourself. You don't want to be this, that opportunist that's cutting people out of deals and always looking mm-hmm. for ways of just progressing yourself. Um, that's kind of playing the short-term game. You really want to play the long-term game and you want to develop those relationships. So I would say do things with honesty and integrity. And then the last one <clears throat> is, um, it sounds like a broad piece of advice, but it is, but it's, it's build, pe- build something people want. And yeah. um, that's, <laughs> I'm stealing from Y Combinator, um, which is one of the biggest accelerators in the world. Yeah. Silicon Valley. And they, their entire thing is build something people want you know um not necessarily something that you just want because sometimes we have an idea we Mm -hmm. want we just want to do it so we convince ourselves that people want it yeah Yeah. you know there's this whole if i build it people will come and tell it to me and it's i wish life worked that way (laughs) but it doesn't (laughs) be nice yeah (laughs) Yeah, that'll be nice you know but you you really need to understand what do people need and so forth and then um and then and then you know use that as a as a means by which you build towards solving that mm-hmm. and then you use it i think that those are probably the three principles that i'll share yeah yeah and those are quite profound principles and and and, and thank you for sharing those I, I love i love the you know seeking the the right validation is super important and you know some one of the pieces of advice you don't often get is around you know acting with honesty and integrity right because it, it you can very easily descend into a into the doggy dog world you know where where you think that's the only way of doing business right and you know you know finally around you know building something people want of course because you know that's how you that's how your business becomes a success is if you know as you mentioned you seeking the right validation from the right people as well so well, finally um for those who want to get to know a little bit more about Jonga as yeah. well as you know want to make a purchase or inquire um how can they reach your offering you know how can they reach you yeah yeah well i mean if you want to find out more about us you can you know have a look at the website mm-hmm. um, so it's uh, www.jonga.co mm-hmm. add .za it's just .co um, <laughs> you know, it's I, quite important, I, yeah. <laughs> it's I, often, important. I often think about the number of emails that are important emails I've probably missed because people have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've <added laughs> the .za, yeah. Yeah, I've added the .za or, or .com, but it's .co. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing. In terms of placing an order, right now it'll be extremely difficult. I'll, I'll be honest because um, you know there's, there's there's a global chip shortage right now that's just applying pressure to the harder industry as a whole. Mm-hmm. That's why it's extremely difficult to find certain cars, extremely difficult to find a PlayStation right now. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to find an iPhone. And it's just because, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened, the pandemic and so forth, that yeah. has really put pressure on the chip manufacturing industry. And as a result, it's extremely difficult for us to get a hold of parts. Mm-hmm. And I, that kind of alludes to the point I'd made earlier around some of the assumptions. Yes. We have made, um, that we're trying to work through at the moment. So it'll be extremely difficult. But um, if the situation changes, we'll definitely be communicating that through different channels. That's yeah. But um, yeah, that's that's that. Well, I, I would encourage you know, everybody to go and and check out you know your your business www.jungo.co. Uh, not dot co dot z a <laughs> make sure that's in there uh please don't go there you won't find anything there <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, i won't be liable for what you see there <laughs> yeah i don't think you'll find anything there but yeah. Zako, i want to thank you um for a most insightful chat i've thoroughly enjoyed it thoroughly enjoyed listening to you i've learned an incredible amount you know listening to you and and listening to your life story listening to the story of how you built your business um so thinking you know listening to how you think and how you you process you know certain challenges that you've you know no doubt been through and you know the reality of of being an entrepreneur um you know speaking about you know the excitement of the future but also the doubts you know that, that come with it as well um, so I want to thank you so much for coming on to Impactful Conversations. I want to wish you 
and your team all the very best with Jonga. I'm sure you know that the exciting steps are you know about to come through. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. Looking forward to see how you know you guys take that on and with with success as you have been doing throughout you know the journey that you've been on so far. So um, I want to thank you so much, and I hope that you've also enjoyed the experience as well. Yeah, I know it's been an awesome experience. You're such a great interviewer. You really got the insights out. So thanks so much, Jaffa, uh, for having me. And I hope it was extremely insightful for your listeners. And um, if they want, you know, more content that I produce, mm-hmm. um, then I just want to invite them to come and check out my YouTube channel. So you can just search for my name, Zako Mkiba. And I speak about these types of things, you know, how do you get investors? How, how do you talk to users? So everyone's always like, talk to users, talk to users. What, is that? what do you say to them? Mm-hmm. That's the kind of stuff that I, that I speak about there. So, yeah, it's just another resource that's available. Obviously, your channel is a great channel for them. Um, but if they are interested, then that's also available. Absolutely, and you know, I'd really encourage everybody to go and do that. We'll put that as well um, in our show notes as well. So, you know, please do go and check that out after you've gone to jungle.co. Uh, you know, add a new tab and go straight to YouTube and you know, search and cycle's name. I think you'll be, you know, much, much richer for it. And to you, the listener, we want to thank you uh, for joining us with episode 36. We want to thank you so much uh, for being a part of the community for engaging with us. Um, if you're listening on the podcast, we want to thank you for listening through. If you're watching on YouTube, we want to thank you for watching. Um, we wish you all the very best for the rest of your day. Whenever you're listening to this, may you keep safe, may you keep healthy, and may you keep wearing your mask and washing your hands and sanitizing. So from Ntako and myself, we want to say thank you so much and goodbye. Bye.